is your news source evening bulletin for today, Wednesday, the 19th day of February in the year 2020. I'm Gordon Mosley. Here is what we're tracking tonight. With several sections of the historic Georgetown City Hall building in total disrepair and falling to pieces, the City Council has launched a renovation fund to pull in more support for the complete restoration of the City Hall. After launching this morning, City Mayor Ubraj Narine set the decision to launch a renovation fund, follow discussions among councillors and the administrative staff. It is something that bleeds my heart to see that one of our historic buildings is falling apart. And I believe that this is the way all of us, not the mayor, the councillors, administration alone can do it. I call on the private sector, civil society, the chambers of commerce, businesses, in the international um, community. I call upon every Guyanese here and abroad to play the role to save City Hall building. He said the project will be piloted by a special committee. The council has set up a special account at the Marara Bank and the mayor assured that all funds received will be properly accounted for and will go towards the project. There's three statutory signatory to the checking account of this restoration account and that is the private sector, a member from the private sector, the National Trust, and the city treasurer of the main city council. There is no one man shoot. There is three statutory signatory. No two person can sign, no one person can sign. All three signatory needed on that check before we start to withdraw money to spend on City Hall. And I can say this to you, that we also have external auditors and the Auditor General will be solely involved in every step of spending the money to save City Hall. Chairman of the Private Sector Commission, Captain Jerry Gavaya, attended the launching also and pledged his full support to the initiative. Mr. Gavaya said the project will receive support from the private sector in more than just words. And I can't help believing that politics, politics helped the deterioration of this building. And I would say to you, never should we allow politics to affect the state of our city. I believe the people of this city must take pride in this city. And the people of this city must, re must, must resist the temptation and the urge of politicians to play politics with the cleanliness of our city and the integrity and beauty of the structures of the city. Never again, Mr. Mayor. And this project, I could commit to you, will have the total support, and not only in words, but certainly in deeds, by the private sector, Commission of Guyana. The Georgetown City Hall was built in 1889 and is one of the oldest wooden buildings in the country. There have been previous attempts to repair the wooden building, but many of those plans never materialized. The city mayor has given an undertaking that his plan will be working. More news coming up in just a moment. GBTI is your Guyanese bank, a bank that understands every customer's unique needs, opportunities, challenges, and financial concerns. At GBTI, we see you for you. Whether you're buying a new home or car, planning your next vacation or retirement, saving for your child's future, or whether you're ready to take that bold step of investing in your dream business idea, we are with you every step of the way. We hear your stories and watch you focus on your dreams as we share your aspirations. We are more than just banking. We are a family. We are part of your community. Our commitment extends way beyond the walls of our branches and is demonstrated every day in the opportunities we provide to our individual and business customers. The support, time and commitment we give back to communities across Guyana to help improve the lives of our Guyanese families because we see Guyana through your eyes.
Wild Super 95 gasoline gives you more reasons to drive and is available at 56 service stations nationwide. For affordable price, high performance and high mileage, choose Guyol's Super 95 gasoline. Hey, the man I could really let you know. Master, we get some first degree. That's a lie. You know, he say family left him money. We know that's a lie. But y'all hear this one, you know. The man said, Oh, we give we 20,000 out flats in Linden. What? Hey, are you from Linden? There's a blatant lie. Well, he say you open back the estate. <laughs> well, that's a sweet lie. Yo, so what if I said that, though? If you are here, you do nothing in four years. This is the biggest man. Watch. You ask this, this son is by here, man. He ain't no leader, no. You're right. That man is not a leader. That man is a liar. I like me a play, come out this place, boy. That was a paid political ad. Voting by proxy. Any voter who is unable to personally vote on election day can apply to vote by proxy, providing that he or she would be on duty because he or she is a member of the disciplined services, connected with the election as assigned by the returning officer, engaged in the running of a vessel for the Transport and Harbors Department on elections day, a duly appointed candidate at the election, and would be away from where he or she is registered to vote on election day. Voters who are blind or otherwise physically incapacitated can also vote by proxy. Application to vote by proxy can be uplifted from the returning officer for the electoral district in which the application is being made from the 14th to the 21st of February 2020. Applications must be submitted to the returning officer no later than the 21st of February 2020. For more information, contact GCOM on 225-02779 or 223-9653. Visit the GCOM website at gcom.org.gy. Email pro at gcom.org.gy org.gy or visit the nearest GCOM office. Tired of long lines? Register with MyGTT at mygtt.co.gy. That's mygtt.co.gy to view and pay your bills from anywhere. Enter to win an Amazon gift card worth 25 US dollars or a bounty voucher worth 5,000 Guyana dollars when you sign up today. GTT, do more. Our military is at the heart of this nation, and just like you serve us, we will continue to serve you. Under the experience of Brigadier Retired David Granger, we have increased the salaries of joint services over the last four years. We have invested in opportunities for quality education so that more ranks are being professionally trained and our special units have been re-engineered. We have modernized the forces, transforming it from dormant and non-performing to a prestigious force in the Caribbean. Better equipment for protecting your families and our nation. Moving forward, we will continue to protect your rights as we focus on your personal development and welfare. This means improved salaries, more specialist trainings, better vehicles and equipment, a new National Police Academy with regional branches, and investing in technological solutions in order to reduce crime. This in addition to continuing the work we have started, improving our operational structure, building new accommodations, and providing improvements to all bases. And finally, every rank must be a homeowner. We will support you in the acquisition of land, with support acquiring loans, and help in construction. With your vote, this will become a reality. As you stand for us as a nation, we will continue to stand with you. Joint services vote this Friday, February 21st. Stand with Granger. Vote APNU AFC. That was a paid political ad. Welcome back. The Ghana Elections Commission has decided to significantly reduce the number of private properties that will be used as polling stations for the upcoming elections. That decision was taken at the last GCOM statutory meeting. The Commission has decided to rely more on the use of public buildings for polling stations. Previously, as many as 700 private residences were used as polling stations. The Elections Commission has now brought that figure down to just around 200. 
GCOM Commissioner Vincent Alexander explained to reporters last night that there were simply too many private properties being used and that should not have been taking place in such large numbers. In relation to the use of public buildings, which people are now arguing to be congested, and so an attempt to resort to some of the private polling places which um, have not been scheduled. GCOM has in principle made the decision to use public buildings and as far as I'm concerned, unless the Secretariat determines that it will be inconvenient to use those public buildings, we should retain those public buildings. Arguments about one entrance and so are erroneous arguments. Anybody who has been involved in elections in the past would know if you go to Sapphire, almost all of half of Sapphire goes to one location, one gate, one big building. Mr. Alexander said the Elections Commission will now be looking at the public places to be used to ensure that those places meet all requirements. So that GCOM has to have a standard operation and cannot discriminate in terms of how you treat one set of people as opposed to how they treat another set of people. So, for me, the administration of GCOM has to establish that there is equal measure in terms of the use of public buildings. Another commissioner says Gunaraj said the move will result in the concentration of voters at one polling station, but he noted that the average per polling station will be close to 400 persons. As you know, the commission took a decision to remove, uh, as far as possible, private residences as polling stations. What this has resulted in, in some areas, is a concentration of polling stations in one location. For example, several stations in one place, uh, which is a cause for concern, as you, you might have seen. It has, been uh, it has been reported in some sections of the press as, as well, because there is concern that the number of persons who may have to access one facility May, uh, may lead and, and because a larger catchment area having a polling station in one place uh, it means that people one have to travel uh, for the distances to reach that polling station to the number of persons who may have to access that polling station that polling place rather uh, to, to visit the polling stations within there uh, may also cause an issue. More than 2,000 polling stations have already been identified for the 2nd of March elections. Persons can go to the GCOM website and enter their personal details to know where they'll have to vote on Elections Day. The newly rehabilitated Georgetown Hospital staff quarters on Quamina and Waterloo Streets was commissioned this morning by President David Granger. The living quarters had been closed for a number of years, but was recently completely rehabilitated and refurbished as part of a Ministry of Public Health initiative. Over $281 million was spent on the rehabilitation work for the 41 apartments in the complex. In brief remarks at the commissioning, President David Granger showered praises on healthcare workers for their commitment and sacrifice. Doctors, as the profession demands, work on call and it is always desirable if they can reside somewhere where they will be able to respond more quickly to their calls. The staff quarters, which we are rededicating today, are just a short distance away from the Georgian Public Hospital Corporation. Um, and it will make it easier for doctors. The president also used the commissioning to plug his decade of development plan and how the health sector fits into that plan. Investment will be increased during what we call the decade of development from this year 2020 to 2029. We are now in the second month of this decade of development. This decade will witness accelerated progress in promoting human development, particularly health. Our government will increase investment in the public health system during this decade. Public expenditure on health care will achieve or surpass PAHO WHO targets of 6% of GDP by the end of this decade. 
The Ministry of Public Health and the Georgetown Public Hospital collaborated on the rehabilitation project. Public Health Minister Valdo Lawrence said the rehabilitation and reopening of the staff quarters forms part of the Public Health Ministry's capacity building. She said the ministry will continue to work to ensure that the needs of staff members are met. As I alluded earlier, challenges and gaps still abound. And our human resource being one of the critical areas which the ministry and the board of directors of the Georgetown Public Hospital Corporation is working assiduously to fill. Notwithstanding, the government of Guyana has facilitated progress in all facets of our health sector, impacting on our service delivery. Equipment, medical facilities, and our HR. The Georgetown Public Hospital has welcomed the reopening of the staff quarters as it remains the busiest hospital in the country. The Department of Energy has announced that Ghana's first 1 million barrels of oil is being lifted and transferred for export. Head of the Department of Energy, Dr. Mark Bino, said it is a significant moment in Ghana's history, noting that it represents the first lift as part of the country's profit oil allocation. This has been quite a momentous occasion looking at where Guyana has come from for the last four years, nine months, from the conceptualization of this project to actual fruition where we begin to see production. Guyana is having her first one million barrels um, lift and given the fact that it's our first lift, it was important for us not only to see this dream becoming a reality, but also to bring the level of assurance to Guyanese that it's no more just a concept, it's actually a reality. Dr. Bainu also explained that Guyana is entitled to approximately 5 million barrels of oil in 2020 alone. And I'm happy to see that Guyana is entitled to approximately 5 million barrels of oil in 2020 alone, plus the 2% royalty, plus withholding taxes plus the direct and indirect benefits through employment creation and other revenue generated income. So this is not a, a, a contract that we should take lightly. It's not an occasion that we should take lightly. It does begin to deliver for Ghana and Guyanese. And we were most proud to be a part of this. And we look forward to even further revenue being generated to really take us along the economic paradigm that we have set ourselves. The Shell Company of Barbados has bought Guyana's first oil lift. The cost has not been released. Guyana became an oil producer back in December. The country will now start receiving funds from that production and export. International banking institutions have predicted that Guyana's economy could grow by more than 80% this year, thanks to the oil economy. In the world of tourism, Guyana continues to see an increase in the arrival of visitors. The Tourism Authority today reported that the country saw the arrival of 314,727 persons last year, and that represents a 9.8% increase over the previous year. The Caribbean region accounted for the largest arrival numbers at 48.5%, with the U.S. coming in second at 31.5% and Canada placing third at 7.1%. There has been an increase in arrivals from the European, American and Caribbean markets, with the Canadian market seeing a decrease by 6.48%. That decrease may be as a result of only one airline serving the Guyana-Canada route. Fly Jamaica, which previously served the route, went out of business at the end of 2018. December remains the busiest month for arrivals in Guyana, with the month of May coming in second. The increase in arrivals in the month of May is being credited to the hosting of Guyana Carnival activities. According to the report, more than 68% of persons who arrived in the country last year came for a vacation. In the courts, three persons, including a husband and wife, were today charged and remanded to jail for the murder of ex-soldier 22-year-old Daniel Ford. The man was beaten to death last week at Silver Hill in the Suicide Highway after one resident claimed that he was a thief. Appearing at the Diamond Magistrates Court this morning were Courtney and Candace Wolf and Kurt Mingo. It was Candace Wolf who reportedly raised an alarm about the presence of Ford in the area, claiming that the man was attempting to break into her shop. The prosecution's case is that she was joined by her husband and another resident of the area and together they savagely beat Daniel Ford about his body. 
The man was reportedly tied up and beaten badly, then fitted into a tire and beaten more until he passed away. The attorney representing the husband and wife pair, Nigel Hughes, told the court that he believes that there has been a miscarriage of justice and he wants the police to conduct a proper investigation. It has been claimed that the wife was held at knife point by the now dead young man and that he damaged various items in the woman's shop. The presiding magistrate remanded all three of the accused to prison until next month. The police prosecutor has indicated to the court that statements were taken from more than 20 witnesses. One resident who witnessed the attack said he saw the young man moments before he was beaten. He said the man appeared mentally ill, and although he pleaded with the other persons to stop the beating, he was ignored, and the beating continued until the youth's death. The incident occurred last week. We are legions of men standing strong, but never too proud to stoop and help someone. We must send a clear signal to all. Do right. Walk in upright ways knowing that's what being a man is all about and ever aware that things will only get worse when good men do nothing stand strong be the one to live right hi i'm andrea farnham and i'm from Mabrumo, region one i have been attending this college for the past month it is a one-year course this is actually the fourth batch of students. I'm part of the fourth set of children that have passed through this college. So this opportunity that it has presented, this college has presented, where they train us to be better public servants is something that I see will be beneficial in my life, not only professional-wise, but personally. This is a wonderful initiative by the Ministry of Presidency that enables us, myself and my peers, to grow professionally. Yeah. I'm David Granger and I approve this message. Voting by proxy. Any voter who is unable to personally vote on election day can apply to vote by proxy, providing that he or she would be on duty because he or she is a member of the disciplined services, connected with the election as assigned by the returning officer, engaged in the running of a vessel for the Transport and Harbors Department on elections day, a duly appointed candidate at the election, and would be away from where he or she is registered to vote on election day. Voters who are blind or otherwise physically incapacitated can also vote by proxy. Application to vote by proxy can be uplifted from the returning officer for the electoral district in which the application is being made from the 14th to the 21st of February 2020. Applications must be submitted to the returning officer no later than the 21st of February 2020. For more information, contact GCOM on 225-02779 or 223-9653. Visit the GCOM website at gcom.org.gy. Email pro at gcom.org.gy gcom.org.gy or visit the nearest GCOM office. Things really moving fast in Guyana and we all got to keep up. In 2015, I didn't even get to vote because I was in the bush. And my boss mounted everything to make sure I couldn't come out in time for Elections Day. I couldn't even get somebody to vote me a proxy. This year, I take in charge. I am voting because it is my right, and I want to have my say for Guyana's future. March 2nd, I am ready. I'm David Granger, and I approve this message. That was a paid political ad. Across the region right now, phone calls and data access are set to become much cheaper when traveling in the Caribbean. Prime Minister of Barbados Mia Motley, in her speech as incoming chairman of CARICOM yesterday, revealed that the region's first across-the-board roaming rate should be a reality at some stage this year. She said Grenada's Prime Minister Dr. Keith Mitchell is leading the charge in an effort to allow people moving between regional jurisdictions to affordably use telecommunications in general by the end of this year. The exorbitant taxes on intra-regional travel has been a deafening blow to the cash-strapped airline Liat. Chairman of the Liat Shareholders Government Group and Prime Minister of St. Vincent Ralph Gonzales stated that aside from the regional carrier's financial woes, the expensive taxations in the Caribbean territories was responsible for declining intra-regional travel. He said it is simply too expensive to travel in the region, and part of that has to do with taxes. He suggested that offering tax rebates to frequent flyers might help 
to increase the airline's traffic. Prime Minister Gonzales indicated that the main blockade to addressing Liat's future and the future of regional air transport was the multilateral air services agreement, which has not yet been ratified by most of the CARICOM states. And finally, tonight international news. The U.S. has sought to increase financial pressure on Venezuela by blacklisting a subsidiary of Russia's state-controlled Rosneft oil giant. The move freezes any U.S. held assets of the Switzerland-based Rosneft trading company. The firm is accused of helping President Nicolas Maduro to evade U.S. sanctions on Venezuela's oil industry. The U.S. accuses Mr. Maduro of leading a corrupt and brutal regime, a charge he has repeatedly rejected. Oil dominates Venezuela's economy, accounting for almost all of its export earnings. But oil production in Venezuela has collapsed in recent years, and the country is in a deep economic crisis. And that's your News Source Evening Bulletin for tonight. I'm Gordon Mosley, reporting.